Does anybody in here think it's wrong to smile in the Lord's house? No. How about laugh? Can you laugh in God's house? You know, if you're saved today and sitting in the Lord's house, you ought to be happy, ain't you? I mean, you should be happy. Uh, and here's, I don't know if any of y'all listen to David Jeremiah on a regular basis, but uh, this week on the show, I was happening to be traveling down the road, and when it come on, and actually me and Andrew were headed to a field trip that he was going on, and uh, I had to stop. I couldn't take no more. David Jeremiah was on, he was on the spot. But he was talking about in our world that the, the description Ezekiel had in what would bring on God showing up in the form of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Now, he spoke about in Ezekiel how two of those three things that must happen have already happened. They're going on right now. You realize that? We're down to number one. We're down to one. Because Israel's in his own land, right? Israel is prospering greatly. The people of Israel are inventing things and the industry's running. All that's happening. The one thing that's not there yet is they're not at peace. Here's what you need to pray about, church. You know what's going to bring them to peace? A world leader that tells all the dogs to get away from them. But what he won't realize by making himself look good, he is going to actually make the prophecy of God come into play because he's going to call off the dogs. But yet he sets in motion the war of all wars. And I had to stop because I was getting happy. Because you know, Ezekiel talks about how much God does when he wins. Amen. <laughs> it doesn't matter what they do. But you don't have to worry about your future if you know God. Amen. If Jesus is your Savior, you don't have to worry. Mark Grover, pray for me, brother. Dear Lord, this Lord, I just pray a special blessing upon our brother Chris this morning. Lord, I just pray that you give him words to say. Lord, that it not be his words, but your words speaking through him. And Lord, we lift our pastor up again today. We just pray that you give him travel mercies as well. In your blessed and holy name we pray. All God's children said. Amen. Amen. Now, this will make you laugh. I'm going to read you a poem a friend of mine wrote. And he wrote it and he handed it to me and he said, If anybody in the world can read this, you can. The title of it is just a dumb old country boy. <laughs> That's funny right there, ain't it? <laughs> just a dumb old country boy. I ain't so smart. When I talk, I get all mixed up and my gears are hard to start. I don't have brains like some folks do. And when it comes to society, my dumbness... I do show. I tried to put a show on once and gave my boots a shine and pressed my suit and bought myself a tie. Hmm, I sure look fine. But when I mixed with that high crowd, my knees began to knock and I stood there like old hound dog and with all that high class stock. I went to the jailhouse to witness for the Lord and I told them how the Lord saved me and they sure look bored. They nudged each other and smiled and said, I heard one convict say, he's dumb. Yeah, but they stayed in and I walked out when leaving time come. Just a dumb old country boy. And I hope I'm just dumb enough to believe every word of God. Amen. Yeah, let me be just dumb enough not to listen to no TV show, not to... Not to believe anybody what they say is, but to read and study the Word of God myself. Everybody sitting in front of me today is a human being. I know that. I'm that smart. Amen. <laughs> in your lifetime, you'll have about 2 million heartbeats. 47,000 thoughts a day. Believe that? Boy, that brain works, don't it? You know, God made that thing to do that. 17 million thoughts a year. Can you gather that up? And over a billion thoughts in your lifetime. That's some amazing numbers. But of the hundreds of millions of thoughts you have, there's a lot of questions in there, isn't there? A lot of questions. Did you know if you heaped all those questions into one pile, three, the big three, and you'll, you'll know when I say them, who am I, why am I here, and where do we come from? 
That's the biggest three questions in a human mind. Run the video. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah. Now listen, I have thought over the years on trying to do that myself, but uh, if Dr. Logridge was alive, he would not like the way I do it. But you'll go online and listen to that message he preached on that, where they made that video out of, and uh, I like that technology. They can do it. But all the questions you have as a, as a human being really don't amount to much if you don't know him. And then we live in a bad world, people. Now, I, 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 I'm glad that Laura went. I told her I talk about her a lot better when she ain't in the room. <laughs> but see, my wife had no idea 10 years ago what she was going to get herself into because one of the things that scared her the most when we met was one of the first times we ever talked. I told her before she, with, that we hung up the phone that I needed to pray for her. Scared her to death. Nobody had ever prayed for her on the phone before, especially a man she didn't know. And she asked me, why would you do that? And I said, well, I did it because if God puts us together, the devil will come at you like you have never seen it before because I hate the devil and he knows it. I work for the king, and everything I love, he has sought to just destroy my entire life. So you will learn some things about the devil you didn't know. Now, ask her now, 10 years later, does she know what I'm talking about? And she said, I don't want to talk about it. I know too much. 
But you never know what tomorrow might hold, do you? You never know. It's been an eventful week at the Rollins house. Amen. Uh, I've had some pride issues this week. Anybody else? Anybody else deal hard with pride? Y'all a bunch of lying things. I got one out there. I got it. I got it. I got it. It's all right. The camera's pointed this way. It's not pointed that way. It's okay. But for the first time in, I've been working a paying job since I was 13. 13 years old. I've been in a grown man's world doing a grown man's job. And Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock was the first time I ever been fired. They got fancy names for it now, but I like Donald Trump's version. You're fired. Simple. But when that happens to you and you call your wife and say, Honey, I just got fired. She says, Good. <laughs> She's learned some things. <laughs> she knows some things. Why? She's listened to me before, knowing I'm never going home without a job. I'm never going to go home from the job I've got unemployed. I think I was unemployed. I, added, I think it was like 37 minutes. I was actually unemployed. I text my new boss and told him that I was ready and he said good come on <laughs> by the way he ain't real it's alright I won't talk about you Dave he's sitting over there but see you got pressure on you we all have pressure on you but it sure does you realize that the first time since my two little boys was born Wednesday night both of them slept all night my house was so quiet it was almost scary not one of them moved a muscle Thursday night, neither one of them, and I told Lars, did you drug my children? <laughs> she said, no. I said, well, God must have because they've been shh, they quiet. Now, they still woke up at 6 o'clock. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but they did sleep all night. But I would ask you to turn your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm, I'm glad our young people are gone because some of them, does anybody believe in Jesus Christ in here today? Amen. Now, that being said, does anybody believe in the devil? in here today that he's real amen whoo because you better believe he is and i'll throw this out there on april the 19th in america you know a lot of stuff bad happens on april the 19th you know that that's a bad day a lot of big stuff big bad things have happened in america but this year there's a movie gonna come out i don't know how far spread it's gonna be but the name of the movie is hell satan h-a-i-l satan i'm talking about in mainstream it's going to be at the theater. Yeah. Now, God's people should be standing in front of the theater. Amen? Just throwing that out there. I guess he didn't like the fact that some of our uh, Christian movies where people were getting saved inside the theater and stuff like that, he didn't like that too much, did he? He had to turn up the heat a little bit and change some things. But folks, be a realist now. You know that demons are real. And that our world is spinning out of control. And we must protect ourselves and our church from the demonic things that come from hell. Y'all agree with that? You know, we got to protect our children from what they hear, what they see. It's, mm. But I ask you today, how big is your God? I bought my God's big because he's proved it to me. Amen? I hope that today that God has proved to you just how big he is. The bigger your issue, the bigger your God can be. But he's only going to be as big as what you'll give him, amen? You've got to give him all of it. There's plenty in Scripture to, to uh, encourage you to that. And before I read that, i got to say this. I had wrote me a note that I had to say it. Listen, if you don't know how big God is, you need to ask somebody. And ask God to direct you to somebody you can talk to that you can see in another human being's life just how big God can be. Now, I know some of my brethren and sisters in here have, over the years, wanted to see miracles. And you pray about it, want to see a miracle, and guess what? If you're living in accordance to God's Word and you're trying to do the right thing, He will show you one. Amen? You want to see something big that God can do? Ask Him. Just don't be shocked on what it might be. Because sometimes he gets to show out in things that we're not really comfortable with. But he gets to show up and show us just exactly who he is. Two things, two stories I'm going to tell you real quick. Because God don't give stories to everybody. You understand that? He don't tell everybody things or you're not being able to see things if he thinks you won't believe it anyway. 
Y'all agree with that? Some stories and some witnesses you need to hear because you are the one that he knows will soak it up and believe it and use it to testify to his glory. Any of y'all remember who Agent Rogers is? One of the finest preachers and pastors that ever graced America. Years ago, I had a chance to be with him, and he was in Atlanta at Southern Baptist Convention. And out in the, you know how they all do, they go out, they got their little tables where they sell their stuff. But there's a lot of talking goes out in the hallway. And I was listening to him tell a story, and I was close enough I could hear the real, the real story come out of his mouth. And I heard him say it from the pulpit years later, several times. But he was talking about, somebody asked him what was the biggest thing that God had ever done in his church to, to impact his ministry. And he says, it was an eight-year-old little girl. And I went, huh? What? That's Adrian Rogers. I listen to him on the radio all the time. see him on TV. And he just said the biggest thing that happened to him was an eight-year-old little girl. I got to hear this. And if you go online, you can see some stuff where you can hear him say it, tell the story probably better than I do, but what it turns out that one, one Sunday he had a little girl that had been in Bible school and she'd been in Sunday school and she decided she was going to give her life to Jesus. And she walked down that aisle of that great big church up in Tennessee. Which some of y'all like me. Little kids coming for Jesus makes me nervous. Amen? It just makes me nervous. That's just a natural reaction. And, and Adrian said it made him nervous. Because he's got all kind of folks up here and he's like, and get some women over there. Get a couple of younger men over there to talk to him about it. Talk to her about it. And after church, the little girl wanted to tell him. She walked up and told Adrian that she just accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And he said, that is awesome. Of course, he presented it to the church with several other people. Everything's good, right? No. A couple, three or four weeks later, the mom bumps into Adrian away from the pulpit and says, my daughter is struggling. She's having a hard time. It's been a bad week. And he was terrified of that. What could be wrong? So right at the end of church service again, <laughs> her mama had encouraged her, you need to tell him. So here she come again. Adrian said he was terrified. <laughs> here she comes down that aisle again. What am I going to do with her? He said he didn't know what to do. He knelt down, got on her level, and asked her, honey, what's the matter? She said, preach, I'm confused. I'm having a bad time with this because you, you, you told me, look, the other Sunday when I got saved, if I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, he lived in me. He said, honey, that's right, he lives in you. She said, I don't understand that. See, them little girls are smart. Because she said, see, if he lives in me, and he's such a big God, and I'm such a little girl, he would just ooze out of me. Agent assured her that everything was going to be all right. He said as she left and church was over, he had to go back around to his office and close the door and get by himself with God and ask God to forgive him. That didn't enough God ooze out of him because God was a lot bigger than he was. And if we let God in us like we're supposed to, he would ooze out of us in every situation we're in. Now that little eight-year-old little girl probably have no idea what kind of impact she had on a man of God in a church at that time, but it changed things. And in our neighborhoods, in our close neighbors here, we have had another one, a young person. Don't knock them young people. God uses young people, amen? He uses children. If you listen, God can speak through the children. One brother of mine called me, and he said, Chris, I got, I got to give you this because I got to give it to somebody, and you would understand. This is what he said. My eight-year-old little grandson got saved a couple weeks ago. I said, that is awesome. He said, you know, we bathed that boy in prayer, and we take him to church every time he's around us. You know, his mom takes him to church and blah, blah, all that stuff. And scared his granddaddy to death. He walked up on the porch and told his granddaddy, I need to get saved. <laughs> he said, uh-oh. Now I got him in trouble now. But he led him to the Lord, and, it, and, a, and a week or so later, he's at school. Standing in the line at the lunchroom. Of course, my friend on the phone starts to whimper a little bit like he's going to cry. Because he said, the young man standing in line, going to lunch, and the teacher asked him, what's wrong? He said, I, 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 I. she said, you're looking at the floor. It looks like you're talking to you. He said, what's the matter? He said, well, see, I just got saved a couple weeks ago. 
And my granddaddy and God told me, you know, I need to be thankful for everything. And I was just trying to say the blessing before I got up to eat. And she said, well, son, that's all good. That is fantastic news. But most people wait till they sit down to eat, to pray. He said, well, ma'am, I know that. But see, I'm, I'm hungry. And if I'm hungry, that Jesus lives in me, he's about to starve to death. Now, that little boy ain't got no idea what he just said, but did you hear what he said? I'm hungry, but if Jesus lives in me, he's starving. There again, when I heard that on the phone, I had to say, I'd be, I had to go find me somewhere to pray. Lord, have mercy. See, if you need things in your life, you ask God for them, and he'll give you things like that to feed your heart, to feed your spirit. That's what these things happen for, to help us. I can't read it from up there. I'm going to read it here. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceitful spirits and doctrines and demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hard iron, forbidding to marry, and commanded to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. And all jokes aside, this is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible right here. For every creature of God is good. And nothing is to be refused if it is received in thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. See, I wrote me a note on it, and Christology says, thank God for hogs. Amen? Mm. So I can get by it, and I won't be messed up. Go to verse 8. Put verse 8 up there, Mark. This is one of my favorites, too. For bodily exercise profits a little. Feed that jockey. I'm good with that. But godliness is profitable in all things, having the promise of life. It is now in that which is to come. I don't have to tell parents how important it is to make sure our children steer away from things that are ungodly. But see, it, the, the, the enemy has created such easy and sly ways these days, hasn't he? I know Mark deals with this with them young people out there, and the, the youth teachers of the world, and they haven't. They just don't, they get, you almost just get confounded by how many devious ways they can come up with to infiltrate the minds and the brains of our young people, our children. But who's responsible? Oh, boy. If we talk about the end times just a little bit, you do realize if you read the, 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 the Scripture and study, especially the Old Testament, that in the, in the end times before they get here, meeting like this will be the most dangerous thing that God's people do. The organized church of America will be extremely dangerous for the believer. So what are we going to do? Do we have a plan? Everybody got a plan? Are we going to all crawl over in the hole and just pray that God deliver us one-on-one? -on -one? Well, see, I, have, I don't know about you, but when I look back at the Old Testament, I get really encouraged because if, if men and women of God have a problem and they really depend on God to handle their problem, there's some miraculous stuff that happens. Amen? I mean, stuff that you can't even imagine happens in... Uh, I like that miraculous stuff, amen? <laughs> I like to see stuff happen that people can't explain. And people say, Chris, how do you know it's a miracle? I said, because you can't explain it. If you could explain it, it'd be explainable. But it's a miracle because you don't have a clue how it happened, why it happened, or nothing else. But this world we live in now, I don't have to tell you. You all have got, most of you anyways, got televisions and stuff like that where you see the... Uh, We've got everything from mainline churches preaching junk to, to demonic churches that are preaching the devil and, and everything in between. We've got, we got a whole realm of everything going on around us. How do we know we're right? How do you know you're right? How do you know you're sitting in a church that speaks the truth? 
it does help when you check, amen? Because, <laughs> you know, there's a couple of commandments that God gave us Christians. One of them said something about hiding the word in your heart, didn't it? Because one of these days, guess what's going to be the most illegal piece of literature on the face of the earth? May be the only place you got it. Are we prepared as a church and as a family of believers to take on what Paul warned Timothy about? Even back to what Ezekiel warned the people of God about. Are we ready for that? And folks, it's not as complicated as it sounds. And here's why. Because most of you, I know a lot of you is a lot more educated than I am. You can talk better than I can. Whatever you want. Some of you can eat a lot more than I can too. I know that for a fact. But see, all we need is that connection to God, right? All we got to do is be plugged into the master. And what separates us from God? Sin. So we need to stop that and keep that hardwired to God all the time. We have got to live lives different than what the world thinks we do. They, they have beat up the church. My entire life has been about the hypocrisy, hypocrisy of the church. From pastors to deacons to lay leaders to everybody, everybody seems to fall. And I'm going to throw this at them. David and I went to the, what's that, it was two Saturdays ago now? We went to the conference in town. And one of the statistics, one of, one of our breakout teachers said, he was talking about in America, 1,500 pastors, is that a year or a month? I think it was a year. 1,500 pastors a year quit the ministry. 4,000 churches in America close up. Every year. That didn't bother me in the least, David. Did it bother you? I was looking at you. It didn't bother you either. You know why that don't bother me? That's not the God I serve. You understand that? A man of God cannot retire or quit from preaching the Word of God. You understand that? Can you get a hold of that? If you called by God, he, he might put you some time off, but you can't quit. Nobody in here quit. There's no retirement plan in here. And those 4,000 churches that, oh, come on now, let me get on my soapbox a minute. You can't bulldoze a church that God wants to stand there. Do you understand that? Amen. You can't burn it down if God puts it there and wants it there. You can't tear it down from the inside out. You can't do it if God puts it there. How big is the God in your life? Well, see, I know a big God, Amen. I've seen a big God. I've seen things happen with my own eyes. That's why people say we're crazy. Fine, but I saw it. I saw what can happen. I've seen what he can do. So why can't I live in victory in the fact that I know no matter what the world does, God wins. Amen? If you don't believe it, flip to the back of the book. Cheat. Flip to the back. I did that one time just to encourage myself. Flipped all the way to the back. Who wins? We win. Okay, I get it. But see, that should give us the, the, the look, the Bible in the Old Testament, I love it. You need to put yourself in line with the people of God because when you call on his name, listen, I know we are a wretched bunch. God knows it too. But you know how much it takes to get God right back with you? Repent. Right then. With a whole heart. And guess what? You and God right back online. Ask him for what you want. Ask him for what you need. He already knows. Because look, the lawyers and the judges didn't invent knowing the answer to the question. Okay? But God does already. Amen? You know, when you want to pray and ask God for something, ain't like he didn't know. <laughs> You're not going to surprise him. I just think it's all funny sometimes people ask me, say, man, you ain't going to believe what they asked that dude in court. And I said, well, you ain't going to believe they knew the answer already before they asked the question. Because if they didn't, that would make you smarter than them, and that ain't going to happen. They're not going to give you that at all. You know who is watching me handle the adversity in my life? The next generation. You know who is watching you handle the adversity in your life? 
whatever children or young people or whatever's watching you. Listen, Wednesday before I left my shop, when I packed up my trailer to leave, there was three or four of them guys wondering if I was going to whip somebody before I left. And I really did want to. I'm telling you the truth. I really did. But that would not bear good witness to him that lives in me. Amen? And I said this before, and I said it again. I know he's recording it, so it's an eyewitness fact. Because, see, there's been some times in my life where God gave me some gifts. I bumped into people later in the dark with nobody around but me and them and God. And they better hope God shows up. But we need to work with the tenacity to our children and the people that are watching us to know that our God cannot be defeated in any fashion. There's nothing on heaven and earth that can deal with God. And you ever heard, you know, we just got through with uh, Ravi Zachariah. I, I watched something the other day. Him arguing with a, uh, not arguing, no, he don't argue. Ravi don't argue. But this atheist stands up and gives him this whole plight about, about his he has take on everything, and Ravi's just standing there looking at him, shaking his head. And the guy said, well, how can you believe this? How can you believe that? How can you believe this? He said, because Jesus saved me. <laughs> and I can believe that. I can believe anything. <laughs> I mean, of course, he went on to, you know how Ravi does it. He can just spin your own mess into telling you how dumb you are <laughs> and how much you need Jesus. I love it. Uh, I'm not capable of doing that. Because <laughs> that's about three minutes. I'm going to go, you need Jesus. You hear me? <laughs> nah. Believe it or not, Laura has calmed me down a lot. She has. That's a blessing. Yeah, she came back in and sat down. That was the only way she did it. Look, I want you to get excited. I, I need my church to get excited about the fact. Have, have any of y'all ever played high school football? Anybody? Anybody? Trevor back there like, yeah. You can do you want to do it again, don't you? <laughs> but have you ever seen the team that shouldn't win, but they do because they believe they can? Well, see, how can God's people act so defeated? I don't get that. I've never been able to grasp the fact that the church of a living Christ, no matter what the other churches, and we know our, our other churches and other denominations and all that mess is a mess. They all want to walk arm in arm with the everything. God only work, walks arm in arm with the truth. And everything we need to know is in the book. Amen? Whether it's not being popular. And it's sooner or later we are going to make the headlines though if we do this right. And then it's going to be good. It's not going to be good in their view of us, but it will be for us because the, what is the best, the best thing to be as a martyr for God? How, how would you love to be? I mean, how would you rather leave this world and be in professing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, saying that there's one God, there's one God, and He is the God of heaven in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank God for Scripture. Come on now. Because see, the charge that, and I know I'm using Paul talking to Timothy, but it's just good stuff. That's why I like it. In 2 Timothy, chapter 4, there's an encouragement. There's a charge. And if, it, if, you, if you're one of those people that don't like to use the word talking about yourself and you don't like to use preach, just insert the word witness instead of preach. And it works out the same way. Because how many times have you heard it? Well, I'm not a preacher, Chris. I don't know what you want me to say. Just tell you what God did for you. What did Jesus do for you? What did he do? Or you, or you hear that brother, well, he helped me out. I woke up this morning. Well, I hate to boast, boast, oh, excuse me, bust his bubble. I always say, well, I just soon woke up in heaven myself. But that's just me. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living 
and the dead. Wait a minute now. I thought some of them crazy Hollywood people said that God wasn't going to judge anybody. That he wasn't in charge of nothing. How many times in the scripture does it say just that right there? He had judged the living and the dead. And his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Let's go ahead and spin it. Witness the word. Teach the word. Live the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort, all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itchy ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, enduring afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. You need to come to grips with the fact that God might have saved you. He didn't kill you when he saved you, so that means he saved you for a purpose. Amen? Amen. You you don't know what that purpose is. It's one of them questions. But see, if you know him, and he saved you, and he didn't kill you, he left you on earth, that means he gave you something to do. Even if it's just leading your son to Jesus. If that's the only purpose that you have in life, is to lead your one and only son into believing Jesus Christ died for him. Ain't that purpose enough? And I said this the other Saturday to David, and it broke my heart. See, I, I got one, one, I want, I, one church person. I'm not going to call him a brother because I don't think he is. But he told me 25 years ago, he said, Chris, you know, boy, with that, with that gift you got, being able to talk like you talk to anybody, man, you need to go to school, boy. You know, if you went to seminary and all, you could get you a six-digit job. And I stepped up real close to him, and I said, I ought to knock you out. Get out of my face. Get away from me. Because if all you study in Scripture with, so you can get you a big church and get you a six-digit six figure, then there ain't no God about you. A man of God, a preacher, can't help but preach. I don't care if he's just working on trucks, amen? Well, wherever I go, wherever I'm fishing. Look, people don't like to go fishing with me because sooner or later we're going to end up talking about what Jesus is doing. Jesus loves fishermen. You don't believe it? Read the Scripture. Might be why I love the fish. I don't know. But the world we live in points us ever which way. To, I mean, how many distractions do you need to keep you away from God? I mean, you can just make up one. You can find it somewhere. Why do you come to church on Sunday? Ask yourself that question. Really, why do you come? And put that in perspective with God. I came because... Not as he ordered me to come, because I need it. I need to feel the worship of God's people. I need to feel the feeling of being around people that are like-minded and kindred spirits to God like myself. See, I don't think Christians can live without church. I can, you know, we go on vacation. I love to find me a little hole-in-the-wall church somewhere. That's some of the best church you'll ever have. Is when you walk in a room, you don't know anybody there. And they know you're on vacation, so they, didn't, they don't ask you any questions either. <laughs> they say you ain't never coming back, so don't worry about it. Just sit down and enjoy church. It's good stuff. But how can you not? And look, we, we got to be real careful the way we do things. Because, look, you don't think, I mean, read your scripture. You read Paul's teaching, what he taught those young men about what to look for and what to look out for. The same can be said to us today. Be real careful on what you read and what you believe. And, you, and you know, I got it. I got some hits back. The, the guy that sent me that thing about the movie on Facebook, and then I heard some stuff come back, and he sent me some remarks that got sent to him and things, and people said, well, you know, it, I mean, it, people know better than that. Really? People know better than that? <laughs> this is the world where we're going to kill how many babies this year? <laughs> really? You don't think they'll fall for that? 
we already got satanic churches coming up all over America today. I mean, whoever, I never thought I would live long enough to drive by. You could see a church with a, that, that mounted goat statue in the front with the horns and all that. In America, come on. But guess what? I mean, I don't know, lost count of how many there is now. They have a whole complex up there in Chicago somewhere. It's a whole, a whole thing. Look, if, without God, everything falls apart. Amen? If you take God out of the picture, which he will gladly walk away if you push him out. Amen? I mean, if you want to stand up, because, you know, he didn't. Dr. Phil did not coin that phrase, by the way. I think that came from heaven. Because God, he'd been telling the people of Israel all their life. Well, let me know how that works out for you. You're going to go do what you want to do? Go ahead. You'll be back. Might not be your generation, but you'll be back. That's why I'm commanded. My wife is commanded to teach my children about a true and righteous God. And a Holy Spirit that's got power like they will never, ever know. There's never been a better time to be a follower of Jesus Christ in the time we live in right now. Because it's the most challenging. Amen? Now, we, I don't know how long it's going to be before we get to defending ourselves. But see, I can't be quite like my four-year-old. I know Trevor's going to laugh at this because I called him and told him. But See, my four-year-old the other day got up on a rope that his brother, which is a lot bigger than him and three years older than him, had tied up. And he's going to swing off something. Whew. Some little boys have to learn things the hard way. But while you're watching out there, just let them do it because they're going to do it anyway. Next time they do it, you might not be out there looking at them. But when your little boy falls down, hits the ground, cuts a flip, and jumps up, and the first thing he says, no worries, Daddy. Jesus got it. I'm good. <laughs> well, that's a scary thought. I told Laura, if you ever see him on top of the house, holler, Jesus ain't here. Get down. <laughs> but that being said, you, I told you, you know how many men have faced Jesus, and the first thing Jesus said to them was, what were you thinking? Let me tell you this, church. You realize if you'll follow God in the way that he wants you to, if you stay re repentive, live right, read and study the scripture, and I believe this with all my heart, I believe that God, when he saved me, I know he had a purpose when I was formed in my mother's womb. I know that. But I made a choice. And the day I made that choice, I believe with all my heart that if I do it his way, that I am 10 foot tall and bulletproof until my day comes. Now, the only way that that day can come early is if I choose to do stupid or to not listen to God or to not be under his blanket of protection, to remove myself from his will. Because I've heard plenty of brothers say, well, you know what, I got my day marked, brother. I said, yeah, and you're standing 75 feet in the air on a two before. Without being tied down. Okay. You got a day, huh? Okay. No, I'm not living like that. But I like being assured that Jesus is my Savior. God is the conqueror. You look at that video. Everybody, should, I watch that thing like three times a week. I've been watching it for months and months. Because if you can't get boosted up listening to that, and I bet old Dr. Lockridge didn't even live long enough to know how big that was going to be to us, the next generation of people. Because we need to tell our neighbors how big our God is. We need to tell our co-workers how big our God is. But don't ask God to test you now because you get fired in front of your friends. You gotta, you're going to have to find out how big your God is. But guess what? I'm going to have to be like Samuel. Jesus got it. Because I looked at one of my friends there and I said, you know what, I'm 54 years old. I ain't never been hungry, cold, or walking unless I chose to. He ain't never let me down. And guess what? He ain't about to start. He never let me down. And he won't let you down either. But it comes more and more every day of our lives is our God's going to have to be bigger in our life. Because those of us that are those around us 
the demonic forces around us are gaining ground. They're getting bigger. And I want to pray for especially one group of people here today because they'd be like myself was. If you have to work around people that are demonic, when you have to engage people on a daily basis that you know are working for the devil himself. See, I can't see how it influenced me because I'm me. I'm not looking at me. My wife can tell you how it influenced me because she's looking at me from the outside. Amen? Amen. Some of y'all, you work around demonic forces. You don't even know how, how it bothers you or how it changes things about you. But ask your wife or ask your husband. He'll tell you because something's changed. Because we don't feel good being around it, do we? Because I look at my old buddy over there, ain't it, David? You don't like it. You just cut the radio off and roll up the window, ain't it, bro? Just you and Jesus. Eh? David Mills, a truck driver. See, truck drivers got it good. <laughs> well, Dave, if you don't like the company, you just stop and get out the truck. <laughs> you, <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, but listen to me. Are we going to impact our world or not? I mean, I, I've never been a, uh, what do you call them kind of speakers? Them encouraging them, uh, what was that guy's name that made a living doing that? Boosting people up. Uh, what was that guy's name, man? He was all over TV, the old big fella. What's his name? I can't even remember his name now. But you are what you, you know, you are awesome. You are this and you are that. You know what you are? If you're saved today, you're a child of the king. That's what you are. And you ought to act accordingly. But the Bible says this. What did Jesus say? I'll give you more than what I've got. I'll give you powers that you don't ever know. I'll give you the Holy Spirit of God to help you. Our next generation deserves to know that Christianity is not dead. That God is not dead. And they shouldn't happen to make a movie just to prove to the world that God is not dead. They ought to be able to follow us around. Amen? Can they follow you home or they follow you to work or they follow you through the gas station and find out that God is real? And the millennials, I, me and David had a good time about the millennials because the millennials said they need more time. They need to spend time with older men that, that know things that get experienced because they didn't have fathers and they didn't have time. Because I looked at one of them, I said, you know how to mow grass? I'll come get you. But how many times in the last two or three years have we heard the word methods at church? Everybody's talking about changing methods. We need to, we need to change methods to to engage our world. We need to change methods to get the young people, to get the millennials, to get all this. You know what? There's only one thing wrong with that. You can change. Jesus had many methods, but he always had one truth. If we change methods and change one bit of truth, we hadn't done anything. It will never work. Because all we have to do is introduce our world to Jesus. That's what they need. And I go to the classes. I go to the seminars. I want to hear what people's got to say, but all the people around me and all my two sons need is to touch the same Jesus that touched me. It won't matter what the method was. It won't matter where they are or what they're doing. If they reach out and they, if they touch the hem of that garment and it does to them what it did to me, it will change everything forever. And inside that little boy, that little girl that's touched that garment is more power than anybody around them can even imagine. Because the next generation, if we're dealing with this mess, think about what they're going to deal with. Am I going to be one of them old men to get to be 75 and go, hey, I ain't got to worry about this no more. I'm going to slide in the back and sit down. No. I want to be standing in the parking lot with the trumpet saying, come on, come on, young people, go get them. I'm going to stay here and fix food. <laughs> go, go. I might teach my little boys how to tote Bibles, amen. And what they do when they come home from school, they say, Daddy, they say, I can't tote my Bible no more. I don't care what they say, take your Bible anyway. Ain't they got the right to tote it if they want to? 
They sure do. And yeah, don't y'all, you know you're going to feel sorry for the teacher that calls me and says, Mr. Rollins, he can't have this Bible here. And I said, well, hold on, I'll be right there. Give me a few minutes, I'll be right there. Because I would love for somebody to explain to me in the school that I pay for why my son can't tote his Bible. <laughs> Just explain that to me. I might need a filter, Laura. You might have to meet me down there. Uh, <laughs> kind of filter that out. Uh, but listen, do you love the Lord? Amen. Is God all-powerful? Amen. Then what's the problem? What's the problem? I encourage my pastor to kick us off, <laughs> to kick us out, make us go do something. He shouldn't have to kick us out. Let's just go do something. Those of us with children, we're around the ball field all the time. What are you at the ball field? Are you just a parent? Or are you a Christian with kids at the ball field? When you hear all the garbage, you need to in, in, inject some Jesus in there. Amen? You have to be careful. And Laura say amen to this. Because some, somebody will follow you to the car with a problem you don't want to know about. Just tell them you'll pray for them and go on. But God expects us to be his children. He expects his army to be strong. And do you think God's army is any smaller today than it was 50 years ago? I don't think it is. I think God's army has always been just right for him. No matter how, what the population is or whatever else. You know what he did with three or four people. Times in scripture you've seen what God can do with one person. Much less 50 or 100 or 1,000. But the question you've got to ask yourself in all that, out of those millions of questions you'll ask yourself over the next few years, do I know him? Do I know Jesus Christ? Because see, if you don't, if you don't know him, none of that what I've said means anything at all to you. Because you don't have any power that comes through him. And the only Holy Spirit you've got around you is the one that's convincing, convincing you and convicting you that you're a sinner. Now listen, some of you all will not have, and I know I'm not talking to all of you, but you've got other people in your life that are. Pray for the people you know to be engaged with the Holy Spirit of God. Somehow, some way, because see, if, if a human being happens to face the Holy Spirit of God, something has to happen. It don't have to be here. It could be in the classroom. It could be in the car. It could be at heart. He's sitting there eating a hamburger. It doesn't matter. But when that person comes face to face with the Holy Spirit of God, things cannot remain the same. Amen? Y'all agree with that? So how do we get them there? Tell them. Don't be scared to tell them how big your God is. Especially when something bad happens in your life. Everybody's looking at you anyway. Do it his way. Even if it hurts. Because pride, you know what God does for pride. <laughs> I ain't got none. Uh -uh. He'll make a prideful man extremely humble real quick. Real quick. But I'm going to pray today that us as a church realize how big our God is. And how much we can do to impact the people. If nothing else, how about the people that's here? Impact each other for God. How about them young people over there? That room, there's a pile of mess over there, ain't it? I know it's loud. It don't smell real good sometimes. But that's the next generation of people that are going to need the power of the Holy Spirit of God to walk like godly people. And they deserve our best. Amen? Boy, that was a fact. Might play that video again for us. over there. Get them pumped back up. Listen to me. I love you. I promised I wasn't going to beat nobody up, and I'm not. But I just want to encourage everybody to know how much Jesus loves you and how much he wants to be your Savior. And how much a human being needs to talk by themselves to God. And not believe when everybody's, well, he knows everything. Yeah, but it works so much better when you say it. Amen. He loves to hear you say it, to verbalize it. To tell him. Because see, after you say it, you can't lie to yourself anymore. <laughs> you can think some stuff up, but when you start talking it, things happen to line up. 
play soap soap. Heavenly Father God, I ask you right now. Lord, I'm going to ask you right now for what we don't deserve. What we can't afford. But you gave it anyway. Lord, I know the anointing of the Spirit is in this room. And there's hearts hurting in this room. There's families that are struggling with different things in this room. But I know how big you are. God, I pray right now that you show up in somebody's life today. Lord, I pray that you shake some families or shake some men and women to let them know just how big you are, how powerful you are, that the powers of this world cannot prevail against you. Give us the strength to handle our struggles. Lord, give us the wisdom to know better than what this world feeds us. Lord, let us look to you. God, pour your spirit in this place this morning.